The daily news moves a bit fast, but how about a show that slows things down a bit? From Jaden Jefferson Report Studios, this is Say More. Is there any time in American history where we really had this much going on in the political space where these circumstances were kind of experienced before? Or is this completely new territory for us? Well, my main area of work is sort of post um, World War II, right? So I can I can sort of think about that in context. And I would go to the Democratic Convention in the late 1960s. I believe it was 1968 off the top of my head. Um, there was a lot of, um, of protesting and anger in Chicago during that convention. And so I, I, I go, I harken back to that time um, as potentially one example. Uh, I'll also say that there's a lot of sort of unhappiness and unease, right, in the, the 1960s. And I think we're seeing that mirrored a bit today also, right, where a lot of people seem jaded, a lot of people seem angry. Uh, there are lots of concerns about, you know, what is an American, what's culture, all these sorts of questions, right, um, are cyclical and they they do go back. Um, I think there are examples from the past, right? And I do think, I think 68 is probably the best example. Um, I will say just as a, a sort of personal story on this, I went on vacation and at the start of my vacation, right, the, the shot happens against Trump. And at the end of my vacation, Biden steps down. And in between that, right, it was the Republican convention. There was more war in Gaza. There was stuff going on in Ukraine. There were French elections. Uh, I wasn't gone that long. <laughs> it was an absurd sort of like two weeks, right? Like it was absolutely absurd. We obviously have foreign policy to talk about too, because you had just mentioned the war in Ukraine right now. But then as quite recently, we started to experience issues with Israel where we have President Biden, who's understanding that, yes, Israel has always been a U.S. ally, but he's now trying to hold Israel and their feet to the fire over the situation where lots of innocent people have died. And so is this relationship really being tested right now? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, certainly it's being tested, right? And I think, to be quite honest, um, the United States is not getting exactly what it wants from the Netanyahu government. Um, we have been an ally with Israel since its since its inception. Um, we've supported them even when they did policies that we weren't um, necessarily fans of, like expanding settlements um, and some of their other wars in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, but public opinion is turning, I think, generally speaking, against the Netanyahu government, right? Um, and I think... Biden understands that, look, internationally, there are issues that are ongoing that that he needs to perhaps rein in Netanyahu. Domestically, right, he's paying a huge cost. And you saw with some people who are quite critical of the um, Israeli government, right, lost their primaries, um, in part because um, APEC was helping fund, you know, opposing candidates. So to keep this a little shorter than than or as short as it should be, Biden had significant domestic concerns, significant international uh, diplomatic concerns, and of course, human rights concerns. And on multiple occasions, he asked Israel to, the Netanyahu government to step it back, and they basically refused. And so this puts us in a real sort of quant, like a real sort of predicament, right? Like, what do we do if you're our ally, but you just keep refusing to do what we ask you to do? And the really interesting part is it's been young people that have kind of been making this push too, because we've seen in the past, obviously, younger generations tending to be more humane in their approach to things. They're not as much concerned about what the history has been. They're more concerned about the now. And we've really seen social media kind of be a tool for young people to kind of share their input on this whole situation. Do we have anything that we can kind of overlap to what's happening now in terms of that? Uh, Vietnam. So we yeah. can go back to the 60s and look at the Vietnam War, right? And that was clearly a sort of example of, of what was happening. Um, but outside of that, um, we've kind of forgotten about it. And um, and your peers may not even know about it, right? But uh, young people really were pushing the sort of Save Darfur movement in the 2000s. Um, generally speaking, anytime there are like significant humanitarian or human rights catastrophes, you do see young people sort of come to the fore and 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 advocate for their positions, which are generally pretty um, focused on helping relieve pain, right? 
uh, this is just amplified uh, because of social media and it's amplified because um, the mainstream news are covering campus events, right? And that sort of amplified the message. Um, but I, I'm not sure if it's significantly different from, you know, other past events. Yeah, and Vietnam was definitely one that came top of mind for me, but just in terms of just the fact that obviously this is young people, but they're pushing on top of a decades-long relationship with Israel that the United States has had. I mean, can we really expect dramatic changes to come out of the young voices in this situation because the relationship with Israel is decades long? Maybe. <laughs> so look, there are a couple of different ways that you can think about trying to... to push your agenda, right? Um, you can do it locally. And that obviously isn't going to have as much of an impact on, you know, big scale international relations issues, but you can certainly press issues locally. And this is why you're seeing a lot of protest on campus with de uh, uh, divestment um, and things of that sort, right? Uh, so that's something that young people can do. Um, they can vote people out that they don't appreciate. Um, their policies that they don't appreciate. And you saw that Biden really got hit pretty hard in Michigan over this, right? And I think that's fine. You can tell your elected officials that you don't like what they're doing. Um, and then they just might not listen to you. And that that is also probably going to happen when it comes to to Israel because it's such it's such an important ally in the Middle East for US military policy, right? It's it's a democracy. Although it's certainly having its its problems with democracy, um, it counters Iran, and we obviously know how we feel about Iran. And so, in that sense, the United States is going to forgive lots of of sins, if you will, because it's such an important geopolitical ally. Having said that, it doesn't mean that like young people who are upset can't say something, and they should, one way or the other, right? One other thing I was interested in seeing, though, in covering foreign policy is how often American citizens are actually engaged, because I noticed that there's sort of a cutoff where there's interest in what's happening and where there's not interest in what's happening. It's either you're young and interested or it's just something that happens and you see it on the news every now and then. Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of different things that can pique someone's interest, right? So you could be a young person and you could be very vocal about Israel and Gaza for one side or the other. Um, but then you're less vocal about Ukraine and Russia. Um, and then you're not vocal at all about Sudan, South Sudan, Eritrea, Central African Republic, Venezuela, Ecuador, <laughs> so on and so forth, right? Um, and, you know, the the there are a couple of reasons for that, right? One, um, if you are young, and your heritage is from the Middle East, you're probably going to care more about Israel and Palestine, uh, and Gaza, um, Hamas. Uh, secondly, um, if you're Jewish, you're probably going to care more about Israel and Hamas, right? Um, third, if you're Ukrainian or if you're from uh, Eastern Europe, you're probably going to be more concerned about Ukraine. So these are the sorts of things that, that would push this. If you have friends that are from those regions, that'll push it also. But secondly, if you're really partisan, like if you're hyper-partisan, that's probably going to drive your positions too, right? So if you are a super, super left-wing person, you're probably going to be driven a lot more on um, Gaza right now because that's what a lot of um, far-left people are talking about. Alternatively, if you're far-right, um, you're probably a lot more pro-Israel right now because that's what they're talking about. And no one's really talking so much about Ukraine. Um, which is problematic, but it's also indicative of like democracies. Um, we pay attention for a little bit and then our attention wanes as the conflicts go on. Um, and this is, is this has sort of always been the case. Uh, and that's that's just how it is, right? I, I'm disappointed that that's the way we are. I as someone who studies human rights, I wish we were always thinking about human rights. But we would get overloaded if we just thought about all the sort of evils and bads and and things that were happening in the world all the time, right? And I remember talking about how foreign policy doesn't tend to shape how people vote in America as much as it maybe should. 
because obviously we're coming into an election season and I don't really hear that being something that drives people's decision making. Has there ever been a time when that has been a main driver for people? Because I think the economy and immigration are kind of top line items. Yeah, well, if we look at polling, they'll tell us, right? It's the economy, it's inflation, it's immigration and things like that. Um, but having said that, uh, or to go back, just to use a fun quotation, right, from James Carvel, who was the, I think, campaign manager for Bill Clinton when he was running for president. Uh, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> because Bill Clinton wanted to talk about sort of everything. And Carvel was, no, it's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. And he kept focusing on that because the economy is what wins you an election, right? And yeah, that's the case. So if you ask like my uncle or aunt or you know your grandpa or your mom or whatever, right? They're probably concerned about uh, inflation, insurance, cost of education, all these sorts of things. Um, having said that, at least in the case of Israel and Hamas, um, you are seeing some voters, especially in places like Michigan, um, who are saying, look, that's our primary issue. Um, and we are going to punish Biden for that before Biden dropped out. And we'll see what happens with Vice President Harris, right, with with um, those same voters. That, I, I don't know how that will turn out yet. We have seen how just very simple issues that we used to be able to address diplomatically have really turned serious because we've really started to hear on both sides of the aisle, so-and-so is bad for democracy. And we're now starting to make these things personal. And so has that ever been a problem before? Have we really just made that much progress in the wrong direction in just the last few years? Well, <laughs> okay. So history is sort of replete with, uh, U.S. history is replete with examples of people who come in and sort of push back democratic ideals. Um, I opened and, a Pandora's box. That's my fault. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not going to go way back in time to, to I'll just start with the, again, the the sort of 1940s or so, right? Yeah, look, there have been pushbacks to against democratization over time in the U.S. Uh, and you can think about McCarthyism in the 50s, anti-communist movements. You could think about um, Jim Crow laws, all sorts of policies like that are very are sort of in this same vein most social science research on this on democratic backsliding suggests that it ebbs and flows so we push towards democracy we get to a point usually when the economy is pretty bad and it pushes us back <laughs> and then people get uh, sort of fed up with that and they get tired of repression and they push forward and it pushes back it's a sort of two steps forward one step back thing so in some sense, what we're seeing isn't necessarily different from some of the past stuff. Um, I'm thinking clearly about what I want to say here. Um, but what we do know as political science researchers, and again, I should point this out, we're, we're, we're experts in this in this field, right? We have PhDs, we spend our life studying these things. Sure, we have our own biases one way or the other. We should never reject that, but I think our love for science sort of pushes beyond that sometimes. And what we're finding is, generally speaking, the threats to democracy are very high right now. Not just in the United States, but really around the world. And if we take a step out of the United States and start thinking about big global trends, um, you'll see that there's a lot in common. And um, here is a bias. Here's my bias. It deals a lot with inequality and the breakdown of a neoliberal economic order that sort of existed since 1945. But I spend a lot of time focusing on inequality. If you ask someone else, they might say it's the environment, so on and so forth. But what we all agree on is that there's this breakdown that's occurring. And there's that constant reminder that democracy isn't something that you do on autopilot. There is no cruise control for this. I mean, you really do have to do it all the time. And I think that people are starting to realize that, but they're only seeing it on the national level. They don't, they don't do the down ballot type situation where they know they have to constantly make their voice heard. I feel like it's something that has become so nationalized. Yeah. And I think there it's partly because people are jaded. It's partly because young people just don't think it matters. It's because they're busy. Um, there, I mean, there are lots of excuses, 
But yeah, we should absolutely vote, especially in local elections, uh, yeah. because that's where you'll impact your, you know, your community the most. Um, one of the things, though, that we're seeing clearly right now is that there is a breakdown of norms and we haven't institutionalized like our procedures. And that's important. Um, norms are standards of appropriate behavior for actors with a given identity. That's a technical definition. But all that means is that given your position, you have certain norms that you abide by. So right now, um, you're a reporter. So, you know, the, the norms that reporters abide by, you're, you're probably following. Um, later on, you might be a student or you might be a, a son or a brother or, you know, whatever, right? Those norms kind of change, but they all sort of dictate how we act. And what's happening really on a large scale is we're saying, okay, we should break down these norms. They don't matter. And what we're finding out is if that happens, there's no sort of safety nets involved. Now, by the way, as an aside to that, um, some norms need to go away, <laughs> but we should debate those. They shouldn't just occur, right? It's This is a complicated sort of four hour talk and I'm gonna stop there. I'm glad you bring that up because I think that that's another thing that's kind of happening right now is the fact that we like to talk about young people a lot, but I know one thing that it may not be universally true, every single person feels this way, but I know there are a lot of people that feel that the current system in the United States doesn't serve them. And I think that that's especially true for a lot of young Americans. And that's not even a political thing. I think that that's just something that is starting to be accepted where they just don't feel that they're getting what they need and therefore don't feel that they have to follow and abide by all the norms because why would you? Yeah, that's fair. And we see that in really a sort of interesting ways. Like I think I read it on CNN yesterday or the day before, there was a, a, a study that's saying that, okay, expenditures are down because everything's expensive. That's fair. But people are taking more and more credit card debt, especially young people, to take vacations, which seems really counterintuitive, right? Like, if you don't have a lot of money, why would you go into debt? But their answers are, I'm not going to be able to afford a house anyway. Sad but <laughs> so, true. Like, so why not live big now? Um, and that sort of breaks down this sort of classic American tale of, you know, work hard, pay for college education, get a house have a spouse, have a dog, a cat, two kids, whatever, right? That's all sort of going out the window. And a lot of people are angry about that. A lot of young people and a lot of older people are angry about not being able to retire comfortably because pensions are gone and other things like that. Um, so yeah, there is a sort of shift against like um, of standards of, of, you know, standard trajectories are sort of going away. And young people are upset about this, absolutely. And they, they by the way, should be. Um, and not just young people your age, right? But um, young people, my, can I call myself young? Not really. Go I'm, ahead. 40, I'm 43. I'm a Gen Xer. I'm not a millennial. I will <laughs> die on that hill. Um, but in my lifetime and, um, and, pe and people who are similarly aged, right? We've lived through a 2008 economic crisis, which essentially destroyed wealth for middle income earners and uh, lower social economic status individuals. Uh, we haven't bounced back since then. Um, then later on, we have a couple of small recessions. We have COVID-19. We have the economic fallout of COVID-19. Um, all of these crises are occurring. It's weird. Two like major economic crises and a global pandemic. So yeah, I would, if I were you, know, um, someone who is especially like 25, 30, I'd be like, wow, like <laughs> this is absurd. I know now we all feel like the bubble's going to burst, but has there been a time in history where everyone collectively accepted that we're kind of going in the wrong direction? Well, there are a couple of times, again, we'll look at the sixties, but um, I actually think this time period is more akin to the um, the time period right before World War I. And right before World War I, we had a, a bit of time before World War I, we had Pax Britannica. So this is a British piece, right? Because Britain was a global hegemon. Um, we had significant amounts of immigration. Um, we had significant amounts of globalization. These are all things that everyone thinks is new, but they're not new at all. Lots of people moving, lots of capital moving, so on and so forth. 
Um, and then it all started breaking down and income inequality started rising dramatically. Um, and Britain could no longer sort of control the world. Um, we should think about that with the United States. Um, and Israel saying, no, thanks, we'll do what we want to do. Um, and I think there was a lot of discontent um, right before World War I, and um, we sort of saw where that, that went. I'm not saying we're going to have a global war now, but I think the, the patterns are pretty familiar. Significant inequality, um, significant migration followed by backlashes against migration, significant capitalization followed by like the downfall of that capitalization, right? Um, and even exacerbated by the amount of damage that our, um, sorry, I'm forgetting the term now, um, our supply chains had um, during COVID and, and continues to this day, right? So there are a lot of similarities to the to the pre-World War I era. I really do agree with the idea that America feels like it's losing control because the game was always, I feel money equals power. And just because we have the number one economy in the world doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be immune from the struggles of the world. I think that that's the thing that's starting to be realized. We're starting to exist in the context that we live amongst others and that all those things factor in, especially COVID. I feel like that was a humbling moment. Yeah, COVID was a humbling moment for sure. Um, I want to go back just to a second to a question that you asked earlier about democratic backslide and how it feels like it's exacerbated recently. It has, but um, it actually started uh, at 9-11. That's really when we started focusing on this backslide. 9-11 uh, occurs, um, the Bush administration gets a lot of new presidential powers and uh, um, other powers with the Patriot Act. The Obama presidency comes in and they keep those powers because presidents always want to keep those powers. Um, and then af after Obama comes in, what, I think Trump comes in, I'm forgetting my American presidents for a second. <laughs> he keeps his power and tries to solidify it. Biden does the same thing. Um, Harris or Trump will do the same thing again, right? So we're seeing a bunch of political consolidation, which leads to back um, to backsliding. Um, but we're also seeing a bunch of populist nationalist stuff, right? Which is the fomenting of anger against transgender people or Muslims or Mexicans or you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sorry, I wanted to say that. <laughs> I wanted to say more about that. Um, and then I forgot your question about um, American power or whatnot. I think that that's valid, though. I'm glad you brought it up because it does correlate to what I was going to go to next, which was the fact that we're also seeing the way we actually go about politics differently. And there are a lot of people that genuinely think that the country is in danger, but in a different perspective. There are some people on the left that think the country is in danger, but then you have people on the right that have a completely different idea of what that danger is. Yeah, absolutely. And so... For people on the left, Project 2025 is absolutely frightening. It reminds them of the Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid, Handmaid's Tale. Um, and then for people on the right, they look at it as a sort of salvation um, from West, uh, from you know, an overreach of liberal ideas. Um, where do I want to go with that? <laughs> I. I think we could divide people into multiple different groups here. We should always take a more complex approach, right? And not a simple approach. I think we have some people, especially on the right, who are afraid that they're being left behind economically. They're afraid that they're living, being left behind culturally. Um, and this is playing out in a number of ways, right? Gun violence, um, as in suicides, um, drug abuse, um, the opioid crisis, the fentanyl crisis, et cetera, right? That's ravaging right, right wing communities across the country. And um, I, what they're looking for really is a simple answer and a strong person answer. And what they're getting is President Trump and people from churches who are, who are sort of saying the same thing, right? It's our traditional values have gone away and this is the way to salvation. And then on the other hand, you've got people who are like real advocates of this stuff, right? And they think that this is the, like norms have broken down and we need to go back to norms that are traditional, right? So this is why you have like the trad wife movement and so on and so forth, where they're saying, look, we have to police 
morality, which is wild when you think about it, because when you think about morality police, you usually think about another country. Um because we because our values have gone so far astray right um and then you have people who are just making money off it grifters uh, yeah and those are three different complex motivations and on the left right you have people who are also making money off of cultural wars you have people who um you know think that traditional norms are repressive so look at lgbt individuals for example um, and then you have some people who are just being left behind economically, et cetera, et cetera. And they feel that the pathway to salvation is through um, a, a bigger welfare state. People, when they have views that they can take those views to social media and make money off of that, there definitely is an influence involved. And I feel like we're going to really look at this 20 years from now, even historically and say, wow, during this whole crisis, we had a running commentary from both sides and I feel that there are going to be historians that value that. Yeah. Gosh, I hope I'm alive in four <laughs> years to, to read these books. Um, if not, please read these books for me. There are a couple of things I think that we should think about with this, right? One is, okay, the economics behind it is highly complex and there are no simple answers. But the truth is a lot of people are being left behind. And that's not just in the United States, but it's globally. It's in capitalist systems and it's in more socialist systems and it's in more communist systems. So we've got to figure out some way to get people who are being left behind in mass to not be left behind. And there need to be policy considerations for this, whether it's conservative or liberal or somewhere in the middle, right? But, um, but those are not easy answers at all. I'm talking about large scale of sort of structural changes like big New Deal changes. Um, we all think about the New Deal now as like, you know, blasé, but it was a BFD to use Biden's terms to Obama back in the day. Um, okay, so that's one, right? Not an easy task. There are two easier tasks that are two easier pathways. One is, uh, and this is going to sound wild talking about it from a political science professor, right? But stop talking about politics so much. Um, at least in terms of uh, whether or not it's like a football game, right? Like your side or the other side. Um, stop, like talk about people, um, like they're people. Let me, look, it's not to say that you can't be angry at people, certainly you can be, but, um, but generally speaking, I think most people kind of want the same things. Most people like in your neighborhood, right? So like you think about your neighborhood, I'll think about my neighborhood. Um, and just think about the sort of people that you see around. Um, I live in Westmoreland in Toledo. It's a more traditionally conservative neighborhood. And I met a person who went to the same college that I did. Uh, it's actually the University of Virginia. And the first thing we started talking about was the removal of Confederate statues. Yeah. And I have a big opinion on the removal of Confederate statues. And he has a big opinion on the removal of Confederate statues. And they differ. Although we both went to UVA, we both love Thomas Jefferson, Asterix, um, all sorts of things like that, right? And my, I walked away thinking, oh, that's a nice guy, but I don't know if I'll ever have anything in common with them. Oh, blah, blah, blah. He's another MAGA guy, blah, 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 right? Um, and I'm wrong. The guy's super nice. The guy cares for his neighborhood. The guy's been very helpful to me. His wife is wonderful. Um, I hope he thinks the same about me. He probably had the same first impression, though, because that's what we're sort of told to think, right? Like, hey, you guys have a Biden or a Harris sticker and I have a Trump sticker. We've got to hate each other. No, not really. So on a low key level, we can start thinking about people in terms of like who we are and how we can help each other and not in terms of my team has to win and your team has to lose. By the way, that's called social identity theory. It's super fascinating stuff. Um, you should immediately run out and find a political psychologist and talk about social identity theory for a long time. <laughs> um, and the other way that we can help this, and I'm going to try to stop sort of using all the time on this. Uh, and this is my old man, you know, get off my lawn sort of speeches, get off social media. Yeah. Truly get off of it. Um, not just because 
it's super bad for people's mental health. And we all know that now there are lots of studies on that, but, um, but part of that's being part of that is that you're just angry all the time. Um, and that's not helpful. Certainly there are things that you're going to be angry about. Certainly you should advocate to make the world what you think is a better place, but, um, social media is really distorting that. Yeah, I think that that's crucial. I mean, even if I had my own pedestal, I would echo that because I feel like that definitely has become part of the problem because there's nothing that annoys me more as a journalist than people identifying themselves based off of their political affiliation. I mean, that's a whole nother problem because that's the thing when you try to encourage democracy, that's just a whole nother way of we're going down a different path when it becomes that. You know, there used to be a time when an election could really come down to, you know, issue and policy and how much you like the candidate. But the fact that we're now just in, you know, different rooms is insane. And I don't know how we expect to get anything done that way. It's becoming increasingly hard. And we know that statistically, right? Yeah. Uh, if Fewer bills are being passed. Um, more executive orders are being used. Um, people are, are certainly on different sort of polls when it comes to their political beliefs and and a lot of that is is being, I think a lot of that is being fomented on purpose. Yeah, least productive Congress combined with the least productive citizens working together. It's going to be a fun few years. <laughs> and I'm glad we got to debrief only what's happened so far, but there's still a lot more to happen. And I appreciate you joining me to talk about it. Yeah, my pleasure as always. Mm -hmm.